Glacier National Park, Montana. Big changes are here. Wow, this is crazy. Some marvels fight to endure. As fresh wonders are revealed. What new wilderness will emerge? That's a massive feature up there. Glacier National Park. Six dramatic peaks over 10,000 feet, all carved by glaciers. Lakes that hold icebergs year round. Countless waterfalls fed by melting snow and ice. To see it, act fast. The earth is warming at an alarming pace. The great ice masses that shape and support this ecosystem will soon be gone. Many things will never be the same. Plants, fish, mammals. Two big questions. How quickly will it change? And what defiant new wilderness will remain? Find out teams of scientists. This is a brand new thing going on here. Explorers. You think I should go a little higher? And adventurers. There's a lot of unknown. They fight to keep up with the speed of change. To predict what will happen next, in an environment already extreme. We've had one record of 166 miles an hour before the instrumentation blew away. We recorded 100 mile an hour winds for 13 hours straight. Dan Fagri is a scientist for the U.S. Geological Survey and this area's lead expert on glaciers the right man to lead a key investigation. The subject, once the park's largest glacier. Its name, Blackfoot. Two years ago, it looked something like this. Then, Thousands of tons of ice collapsed at once. Some 25 acres gone. Perhaps a defining moment for this wilderness. Only Dan can say for sure. He's been desperate for an up-close look at the collapse. Let me get that one out. We need to get in and see what's happening in this glacier. 
It's just now coming out from under the snow. We want to do some mapping and uh, look at this because it's a pretty dramatic feature. Yep. Okay. You all set? Yep. It's a three-day expedition, much of it off the beaten track. What they find will help Dan estimate how long before all the park's glaciers are gone for good. The rate at which we've seen glaciers melting here is already quite dramatic. But uh, when they're occurring in these large events like this, it means that the pace is quickened. The success of this mission is still uncertain. Weather has stopped them before. Rain, lightning, fog, snow, all a gamble. Most of the year, Glacier looks like this. The true nature of this wilderness hides beneath a blanket of white, up to 20 feet deep. Then everything changes. Summer opens a window, and for a brief time, explorers try their luck. For tourists, the going to the sun road opens clear through. The only road that cuts through the heart of this million acre wilderness. This road is how some two million visitors a year taste Glacier's splendor. As they travel 50 miles from one side of the park to the other. But beyond the blacktop, safe passage in this region is less certain. Where Montana borders Canada, is a mountainous area ecologists call the crown of the continent. Right in the middle, Glacier National Park. It joins Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park to make the jewel in this crown. The continental divide splits it all into two unpredictable weather systems. The mountainous western half is wetter, getting its weather from the Pacific Ocean. The eastern half is drier and adjoins the vast plains of the Midwest. Eighteen of the park's 26 remaining glaciers cluster along this divide. In the drier months, both sides depend on water from melting glaciers. But for how much longer? Well, the stream we're next to right now is basically meltwater from the snowfields and the glaciers. A lot of these systems that depend on this water are going to dry up and you'll have big changes in vegetation. At more than 50 sites throughout the park, scientists monitor the habitat, biology, and chemistry of streams and waterways like this, with some startling results. It's a circulatory system, and National Park's ecologist, Billy Schweiger, is the man with his finger on the pulse. It's essentially a collection of vital signs um, of the, the health, the 
the ecological integrity of uh, the streams. The algae on this rock are called didymo. Common name, rock snot. It's natural for some of it to be here. But last week, Billy encountered Didymo unlike anything he had ever seen. Look at this. You know, we stumbled upon this the other day and, and it's just like, wow, this is crazy. You know, why is this happening? A thick carpet of rock snot covers an area some 100 yards square. Possibly the park's largest bloom ever. So the texture is very much like wet cotton. It feels like walking on shag carpet. For an aquatic insect trying to live in this, they want it to look like that, right? But it looks like this. This is a completely qualitative change in what this stream is like. Didymo is beginning to bloom in large mats elsewhere as well, likely driven by warming water. These kinds of blooms of Didymo did not occur five or 10 years ago. With water temperatures increasing, with the summers getting longer, there's a good chance that this will continue to increase. We definitely have to watch this really carefully. Didymo choking the waterways may imperil fish. Fish already threatened by disturbed habitat, changes in temperature patterns, and invasive species. Yet there is hope that nature's resilience will win over. All right, all aboard. Let's go catch some bull trout. Clint Mulfield is on a three-day expedition to the park's remote north. What he finds may give new hope to populations threatened by climate change. Well, what's so exciting is that this population might have a better chance of persisting over time in the face of a warming climate. This team of USGS fisheries researchers paddles across lower Kintla Lake. Below them, the type of biological change common throughout Glacier National Park. These native bull trout are threatened by invasive species. We've seen tremendous declines in bull trout populations to the point that many of these populations are literally on the brink of extinction. But traversing Lower Kintla Lake is just the beginning of their quest. They've had a report of odd goings on in the next leg up. Home to some of the strangest fish in the park. Clint and his USGS crew hike upstream, deeper into the backcountry, to upper Kintla Lake. Their mission, to find out how the fish in upper Kintla survive and thrive. Upper and lower are two lakes separated by large waterfalls. Barriers that stop invasive fish from swimming upstream. The Upper Kentla population has not been perturbed at all. It's remained like it is today over 10 to 14,000 years. In isolation, Upper Kintla's fish seem to have adopted the strangest habits.
For one, 